tell me, tell us what you're doing. What is the new company that you're pursuing and how recent is it? Okay, my new company is a change leadership school. And I started it like three weeks ago, almost. Oh, wow. Three Congratulations. Yeah. But so many things have been happening that it feels that I started like, I don't know, two years ago. <laughs> so, um, so what are, when you say so many things are happening, it sounds like momentum. What's, what's going on? Basically, I mean, what we do is like help people accelerate their path to become a change maker, right? Like I always make a difference between being a change leader that feels that only leaders can affect change, but actually everyone, regardless of their position, job or whatever, can be an agent of change. So basically what we're doing is preparing people, teams and organizations to be more adaptive, to be more open and more flexible when it comes to dealing with change. Change in every matter of life, if it's like I know, uh, an, uh, death on a family, a new boss coming to town and taking the, the leadership of a company, change of direction, someone rewriting the role of what you've been doing for many, many years, that drives people crazy. Puts people on a defense mode. People don't like change because it, they feel like threatened. But actually what we do is to tell people that change is actually an, a source, a weapon that can bring the best out of you it basically can help you. So basically, instead of being defensive and reacting to change, we coach and teach people how to better prepare, how to deal with change and actually thrive in change. Gustavo, is it change that is forced from the outside or change that people trying to create from the inside? That's a great question. I mean, change, it's both inside and outside, but importantly, most of the time change happens outside but our relationship with change happens inside. And that's perfectly the first differentiation that we do with people. You cannot control the environment. You cannot control what other people are going to do. You cannot control the politics, the economy, the world, the climate, whatever. What you can control is how you deal, how you adapt, and how you prepare to deal with those things. Mm -hmm. yeah, What's an example? Can you give a concrete example of maybe a change process that that you've confronted either in your own life or with one of your clients? Yeah, I think that for example, like a, one thing that we work a lot is with teams and, and, and we saw a lot of teams that for example, you have that, that team that is the most successful in the company that are always over delivering in terms of goals, et cetera, et cetera. And one time for whatever reason, they stop, they become more stuck and they're not as good performers as they used to be. And normally those guys don't know how to deal with that because they're used to success and for them success feeds future success. And once they start losing that mojo, they get stuck. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we work with those guys is how to first regain the confidence, but also understand that probably, most probably, what worked in the past won't work in current scenario. So we need to reframe and rewrite the rules of success for that team. Mm -hmm. uh Oh, were you going to say something else? Yeah. No, I can give you another example. Okay. Like we are working with an organization out of Chicago and basically it's, it's, a, it's an organization that's kind of in between a non-for-profit and a for-profit. Let's say that the purpose of the organization is for-profit, but the team and the way the, the organization used to operate was more non-for-profit. Mm. And they brought in a new CEO that came from the, let's say, traditional corporate world. And that created a huge crash no? in terms of both the new approach of doing things versus the traditional culture. And one of the things that we were hired to do is how can we bring those together? The initial ask was for the C from the CEO to say, I, I want to turn this into a for-profit culture. And what we discovered working with the team is like, it's not one or the other, it's how can we bring uh, both the aspects to work together in collaboration because there are very good aspects in being a, a non-for-profit behavior, right? The social component, trying to bring value to people, not just for the company, and the other way around, the, the more efficient, goal-driven uh, mindset of a uh, for-profit. So that was an interesting, how you deal with that crash of cultures, and instead of saying you have to choose, you kind of find the best and the right balance between both cultures. Mm -hmm. Gustavo, I'm fascinated by you personally and your process because I know innovation is a big part of your of your essence and your being. Um, can you 
talk a little bit about um, how that how you synthesize an approach to innovation into doing new things in your own in your personal life yeah i think that i mean i, I talk a lot about change today more than innovation because it feels that innovation people are not only turn into a buzz word but most importantly people think of innovation like a something that we create like a new app a new product a new uh, process like they think of innovation as a thing but for us, innovation is a culture, it's a mindset, and you need to prepare for that. In my particular uh, life, I'm always been to a, a change addict, I would say. <laughs> but basically, because I think that either you change or something's going to change you. And I like to be in control of my own life because it's funnier, and also you choose your own path. So I always try to reinvent myself throughout my career. A lot of people got into this notion, ah, you're 50 and you're launching a startup. I'm playing with that, but actually, I think that in my case, it's more of, I've been doing this all my life to find new ways of doing things and explore and experiment. Of course, the older you get, the safer the, the place that you work at feels that, ah, you should stay and, and, and collect, so to speak. <laughs> but in my, in my mind, I think that I don't, I, I don't agree with that because I like to find new ways. And I think that if you don't create your own path, as I mentioned before, someone's going to create it for you. Mm -hmm. So, what are are there any are there any fears? Are there any things that you're concerned about starting something at an older age? An older, like I said, we're peers. So, no, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that age is a factor, but I think that more than a factor ends being an excuse because I don't think if you try to really find what's the limitation that age might really drive into someone starting something new. I don't know if there's any research that proves that older age mean, uh, increases chances of, of a failure. I think it's on the contrary. Uh, uh, um, there's a lot of research that shows Kaufman Foundation tracks how many uh, people run businesses and start businesses by age bracket. And actually, what, what is surprising is that in the past 10 years or so, the number of innovators that come from a younger age has decreased and the number of innovators from age 45 and above have dramatically increased, almost doubled. So that's a, that's a fact. The other thing is there's a lot of preparation. So I think that, uh, as I mentioned in one article I posted lately, like the more you experience through life, the more diverse people you interact with, the more that you travel read, explore the new stuff, that makes you richer as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur. And also, if you run, like I've been lucky enough to run like five, six companies in my life, you learn a lot about running. So when you're going to start your business, you are not starting from necessarily scratch. You don't have a business, but you have all that experience and you know how to deal with turbulent times. <laughs> so... Mm. Have you always been this way or is there, tell me that an experience maybe that launched your interest and connection to, to this idea. You said you're a change addict. What's an early experience that made you realize that? Uh, I cannot, I mean, it's hard to try to find like if there's something, I think that always people try to, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but people try to find like a one event that was life changing. I think that if you are close to some very dramatic event like death or a disease or losing, maybe that can be. But I think that normally, most of the time, at least in my life, it's a, it's a little bit of little events that when you bring them, bring them all together, that's what really caused the, that desire for change. I remember one thing when I was a kid, my mom used to give us a lot of freedom. We're like a family of seven, so she couldn't take care of us. And I learned, for example, to take care of myself being alone at home. I learned how to cook on my own, and now cook has turned into a passion. I do any kind of uh, cooking in the world that you can imagine because I love it. Maybe other people in that same condition didn't choose that path. No? So it's a little bit of combination of outside um, events and then choices and preferences. Uh, I think that, I mean, I have some stuff. I, I, at one point in my life, I got lost in the middle of the forest in the Patagonia, and I had to spend and survive one night without the right uh, 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 clothes because it was really it got really cold and I didn't have anything to protect myself. I didn't have food, I didn't have light, I didn't have a match, I didn't have anything. And that was a life-changing event because I thought, well, I'm going to die, 
but luckily I was very like, okay, I'm not going to die. I need to stay calm. And basically my objective wasn't to find my way back. My, my objective was I'm going to stop where I am because it's getting darker and colder. I'm going to find a way to survive, to pause. And then in the, in the morning, hopefully someone rescues me or I'm going to find my way back. No, and I have many events like those that I always define that they're life changing, but basically it tests your resilience. It tests your ability to say, okay, you can kill yourself or you can say, look, I have a lot of stuff that I want to do before I die, so I better stay put. No? So it's interesting that idea uh, in the forest. How old were you when that happened? I wasn't that young. I was in my 30s or whatever, but either way. <laughs> It's okay. The Patagonia is big. Um, exactly. So, but talk about what I like is what you said, though, that idea of I'm going to stop, assess. I mean, that process, very intense at that moment, that process of stopping, assessing, um, looking at what you can do now, and then hoping then that the universe helps you the next day. Does that, did I just make that up? Or does that sound like a process that applies to your day to day life? That sounds like a process. I mean, earlier before you, you asked about fears, right? And then you talk about this process that feels like very dry or, or, or thoughtful or rational about stopping, thinking, finding a solution. So I think I combine both, right? I'm very emotional. I have a, a half of my blood is from Italian background and half of my blood comes from my other grandparent, which is German or was German. So I think I have that, I try to balance those. Sometimes one side overtakes the other. But I think, that, I mean, we all have fear. It's not that we don't have fear, but once again, like the same as change. It's more like how you react to it than the fear itself. I learned to feed from fear. I learned to feed from frustration and turn those into energies. No, That's something that we teach people in, in our school, like, it's not that people that are successful, like some trying to show is they are perfect, they don't, they don't have flaws, they don't make mistakes, they don't have fears. On the contrary, I think that we need to, one of the things I try to promote is the, the more mindful and, and, and human side of leaders to show people like leaders are just like you and me. We have the same issues, we have the same issues at home, we have the same fears, we have the same challenge, we do have to pay a mortgage, send our kids to school, whatever but that shouldn't stop you from being the best person you can. So the same, we were talking about age before too. So yeah, it might be a limitation because you're more comfortable. You might think that, oh, but I think that we need to challenge that stuff. First of all, people are living much more than they used to. So what in the past used to be like a limitation today is like, I think that 50 is the new 30, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> if you want a headline. I'll vote but, for that. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. But I, I think that it's like a, uh, in we were sold a model about life you have to work to retire and i don't want to retire from life you know what i mean so it's retirement is not retirement for so for me i don't see myself not working because for me if i'm not doing proper work to earn money i'm cooking for my family i'm biking how many miles i come i'm doing something uh, uh, I'm writing. I'm, I'm there. So for me, it's about, you're always working. Working is good. I mean, it's uh, we have the ability. We're not like yeah, we can do stuff with our hands. We can do stuff with our brain. And that's what makes us a productive person. So I think that a lot of people that retire have a lot of money. They go away, and then they start feeling really depressed because they they are not producing. They're not adding value to the society. They're not doing something that's meaningful, and that hurts your basic human uh, motivation. Mm -hmm. And so I saw that you also do work, you do work with teams, but also individuals. So if someone maybe hasn't achieved their dream, maybe someone has worked in the corporate letter, do you believe, or is that what you do, that you can teach them how to change that mindset to be open and expansive to new things? Yes. And that's something that we, we do a lot, which is teach people to overcome their own limitations and change their mindset. Because I think the like we always say like a uh, stretch your mind, stretch your world. You know, that's the motto of our school because at the end of the day, when you amplify the way you see life, your perspective, a lot of possibilities open up. So we use the word teach, but sometimes I like to use it like with a, with a word of caution because it's not that something that you give a talk and people are going to get it. It's not about reading an article or something and people are going to learn how to do something new. 
we focus a lot in learning experiences. It's more about coaching behaviors. It's more about giving people a safe space where they can experiment and see that not only nothing bad happens, but actually they start having fun while, doing, while experimenting being a different person. No? We have many layers as human beings, and normally we tend to overplay those layers that are more familiar or more comfortable to us. What we're trying to do to people is like, I mean, you're a professional, you're a dad or a mom or a sister or, a husband or whatever, but there are many more you, uh, aspects to that self. And when you explore those, you can see that your uh, possibilities are somehow endless, I would say. Mm. And when you say school, is it still going out and coaching people or is, do you actually have a place where, let's say, people could sign up and come take a, I want to change class? A, we have like a different model. I, our school is more of a, a like a fluid school because we were we go where people are. So many times, most of the things that we do, we do it in corporations. So we go to a specific organization to run something. But we also, for example, we do in Matter or eighteen seventy one like workshops, and people from different organizations go there. I think that our approach to space is about how can we be more mindful of how we use space. So for now, we don't want to have a space that people come. We want to go where people are. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. There's a place in, in Goose Island called like Lost Arts. And that's a place that has a lot of tools for people to make stuff from uh, sewing machines to 3D printing to drills, hammers, you name it, right? All those stuff that I'm not very good at using. Mm -hmm. But... If you want to create an experience where people, where you want to uh, provoke people to do more stuff, that's the right place to take them because you can do exercise, but also you can ask people to start using tools that normally they're not very comfortable with. So you break that barrier of, ah, I cannot do this by making people do stuff. The other thing is like, there's a lot of uh, companies that want to do their uh, company outings. And normally the idea is let's go to a hotel in front of a lake and it's going to be super cool, whatever. Sometimes we caution people because depending on the, the, the thing that you want to achieve, choose the place. If you do everything in a cool space and then you go back to your regular job, you're going to associate your office as an uncool place that you cannot do things mm -hmm. and only you can do experimental things outside. And that's going to hurt the culture more than encourage people to be more experimental. So that's, in a nutshell, we want to be very mindful of depending on the experience, depending on what you're trying to achieve, choose the right space. Okay. So I think that you've talked about age and aging within the context of goals. Uh, so just two more questions. One related to where you are is, so where do you see, what's your dream or passion that you see? What does it look like for you? My passion is about, I, I want to, I mean, one thing I learned, I work in marketing for, for many, many years and innovation and that stuff. And basically, uh, what I was doing was helping companies solve their problems, right? And doing that, I realized that there's a bigger problem that needs to be solved, which is the people factor, the people problem. So people today are not happy at, with their own work. The workplace is not a safe space the workplace is not encouraging people what I call like to bring their souls to work. No, it's like people feel the, this division between the, the personal self and the professional self. And we talk a lot about work and, and, and personal life balance. And that's a, a, a wrong question because it's first, we never find balance in life, right? Where we're struggling, but also it's like we're splitting those two aspects of who we are as persons like if they were opposite forces instead of retrofitting from each other so my passion today is about helping people solve their own problems it's about helping people feel better on their personal and professional lives it's about like unleashing and helping them uh, be the best that they can be so instead of being limited by their own thoughts belief and someone else and their job or the company they work at it's like how can we bring all those aspects together and help people uh, achieve their dreams? So the same way I have jumped many times in my life to take risks, to experiment, and nothing bad happened, and I learned and I grew a lot as a person, I want to help people do that. Because people believe that it's hard, that it's just for some people, and we kind of uh, uh, turn 
a success or, or joy or personal development into something that is exclusive when it should be inclusive for everyone, regardless of age, regardless of sex, regardless of economic uh, background. No? Mm. Um, let's talk about the, well, I'm just going to ask because now I'm curious when you say there's times where you took big risks and you jumped and it was good. Is there one that particularly stands out where you're like, I don't know if I should do this and you did and it was good? Well, what I just did, it's the first one that comes to mind, <laughs> like uh, giving up a job at a great company to start a business, that's one. I did that like uh, when when I was in Latin America, I was running the largest advertising network there, and uh, I saw that digital marketing was becoming the, the new thing, and my boss thought that that wasn't the case, and I say I'm going to do it. And at that time, I had a, a newborn. My kid was less than six months old, and I had to give away my job, my career, everything to start a company. And it took me like a year and a half to actually start getting traction. And then it went really successful. But all the days you say, what am I doing? What am I doing? <laughs> Why did I take this? But that's, that's natural. I think that it happens to me now that I say, why did I take this leap? Why did I change my career? Whatever. And I slapped my face and you know, I said, you need to move on <laughs> because you really did it. I always told my wife, once you cross a line, there's no purpose in looking back. You're just going to find doubt, remorse, regrets, look forward. And that's the only way to build your future. Huh? That is fabulous. And also a good transition to the technology. So what year was it when you saw that digital marketing was moving forward and then yeah, well, what year was it? And then how did you, what way did you see that it would be powerful? Uh, I saw that digital marketing would become something very important at least 12 or over, I don't know, I, I lost the count years ago. And it was still like starting. And I think the focus on digital was more about like building digital presence, right? And having a website was the only thing that, that existed. And I, th I always saw that, that, um, that technology would bring people together and I experienced a lot of that, the, the community, the collaboration, more openness. Uh, I mean, social media and other tools have provided the ability for people to exchange ideas. There's a lot of people that are writing, sharing a code, sharing a solution to fix whatever car, uh, electronic. So that's something that has really encouraged our path to become a better society. To be honest, I'm a little bit frustrated because like everything, like, there's a uh, business behind it. And now you can have a great idea, but the ideas that Google is promoting through their search engine are not yours, but are some companies that is paying for that. So like always money gets on the way of uh, improvement. And I think that also tools like Facebook would prove to be very interesting and are very interesting in terms of bringing people together. They're also deviating people from the real purpose, not just wasting time, but also like people think that they share a motivational quote and then they're going to be better. And that's just to get started. So if you don't do something about it, sharing nice stuff on the web is not going to make your life better. So I think one of the, the, the challenges I see is that technology has simplified and make things easier, but not to make our life easier. And that's where people get confused. Living is not an easy task. It's basically about self-discovery on a daily basis. So I think that we have easy access to information, but living is not about shortcuts. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. And how do you incorporate technology? Is that an important part of the process that you deliver service to your clients? I think that we try to, to, to use technology in a different way. So for example, one of the things we do a lot, we've been doing this in past years, when it comes to driving uh, workshops, we ask people to let go of their phones. So we have a, a parking lot for the phones and during the three hours that they're working, they put the phones aside. So it really changes their, because people are much more into it. They're focused. They're not just distracted. And that's a I think that we're trying, technology is not good or bad, like anything in life, it's how you use it. So basically we teach people to be more mindful about technology. So checking your email all the time, taking, taking every, every other uh, tool or social media all the time doesn't help you be present. And that affects a lot of the working relationship because everyone comes to a meeting with a different mindset and everyone's distracted so nothing gets done. 
and that adds more frustration to the team. So one of the things that people drives frustration at work is that people don't really produce something that's meaningful. So if you're distracted, if you're not paying attention, if you're not present, how can you work together with someone else? Mm. Uh, the same way we, for example, we ask people to, to bring their mindset to the meeting. So before you get started, tell people what, what got, what's got your attention, what's going on with your mind, where you're worried. So people know that if you have something going on at home or, or another aspect of your life, then they're going to be a little bit more mindful and the uh, engagement and the collaboration is going to be better. Are you familiar just on that one? It's called the sanctuary model. Are you familiar with that? No, no. Only because what you just said, we used to, I worked, when I worked at Jewish Child and Family Services, we started every staff meeting by everyone going around talking about, you know, kind of what, what, where they were coming from, how they were feeling. Sanctuary model, just in case it's helpful to look at it. It's, um, it's in, um, the, it's in the foster care and, uh, uh, when they're dealing with kids who have been abused or have been victims of trauma, the sanctuary model is a model that's used when approaching working with um, with youth and building okay. that. So awesome. I will check it. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> very point. thorough, very thought out. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so other than the fact that I'm now convinced this is you're so fascinating. There are so many quotes. So now there's going to be all these Gustavo quotes, like individual gems. <laughs> that'll be on the show. Um, what have it, but I want to be respectful of time. Is there something when I said I'd like to do this interview, is you, there's something you thought I would ask you or you wanted to make sure that you shared with me that I haven't asked? No, 